It was August 21st, 1920 in Tulsa, Oklahoma. White taxi cab driver Homanita picked up two men and a woman outside of the Tulsa Hotel with a destination for Red Fork, Oklahoma, a town about three miles north of Tulsa. As they got closer to Red Fork, one of the men beat Homanita with the barrel of his revolver. The gang then dragged Homanita into the back seat of their car and the assailants started driving. Homanita begged them to take the car and the money, but as the gang got to Red Fork, they shot him in the stomach. They then kicked him out of the car and left him for dead. As luck would have it though he didn't die and he was able to crawl to a garage station where he was rushed to the hospital the next day a man by the name of Roy Belton caught a bus from Tulsa to Nottawa during the ride he read a newspaper article aloud about the hijacking and bragged that he knew the woman involved and even discussed the crime when they reached the town of Nottawa the bus driver called the police and the man was promptly arrested Homanita then identified him as the shooter with Belton, insisting that he had an alibi and he was with a woman by the name of Marie Harmon. The police also spoke to Harmon and she confessed that she was in Homanita's cab with Belton and another man. The next day, Roy Belton confessed. All of these events were front page news and Belton was locked up at the top of the local jail over the courthouse. He was assured that he would not be subjected to mob violence, but Sheriff James Woodley heard that if Homanita were to die, a mob would overrun the courthouse. So he ordered armed guards to protect Belton. As fate would have it though, Homanita would die that Saturday. In the next morning, Ray Belton was arraigned in court and pled not guilty to murder charges. That evening, a small group of armed men quietly gathered and drove to the courthouse. The group entered the courthouse and confronted Sheriff Woodley at gunpoint and demanded Belton. The group then disarmed Woodley, pushed him up the stairs, and demanded he instruct his guards to release Belton. The mob rushed Belton out of the courthouse where Belton was placed in Homanita's now stolen cab and drove him nine miles outside of Tulsa. As men prepared to lynch Belton, they asked if he had any last words and he simply stated, I'm innocent. See, the African-American population of Tulsa took notice of this. If the Tulsa police couldn't protect a white man from a very public lynching, black prisoners would never be safe in their custody. Welcome. This is One Mike Black History. I'm your host, Country Boy, and this is the story of Black Wall Street. If you like stories like this, you can find more stories like this at onemikehistory.com. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, you can do so on my Buy Me Coffee or my Patreon page in the description below. Also, give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and support the YouTube channel. But without further ado, let's get started. Tulsa, Oklahoma was first settled in 1836 by the Creek Native Americans, and they called the village Lakapoka or Place of Turtles near the Arkansas River. The first white settlers arrived around the 1880s, and they would name the area Tulsi Town. At the time, there was little more than a trading post for local farmers. By the turn of the century, though, it was mostly a cow town, which was a town where thousands of cattle were driven through the center of the town. Main Street had no sidewalks, street lights or sewer service it smelled like livestock because of all the pigs and cattle and rain barrels caused millions of mosquitoes to breed by 1905 tosa had phone service but no phone book and when the robinson hotel was built in 1904 tosa had no sewage system and its sewage ran into an open ditch into the street Things started to change for Tulsa about 1901 with the first major oil discovery in Red Fork. Newspapers would call it the Great Oil Strike and spoke about how the oil strike brought oil workers and investors to the area. See, at the time, people avoided Tulsa because of the expense of crossing the Arkansas River. So city officials wanted to build a bridge across the Arkansas River, but it couldn't get the bond passed. So three private investors raised $50,000 so they could build a bridge with a toll cross. This allowed goods and workers to flow from Red Fork into Tulsa. Building the bridge across the Arkansas River was the first major challenge for Tulsa. The second was connecting Tulsa to the railroad network that ran through Oklahoma. In 1901, the Katy Railroad announced plans to complete a line from Muskogee to Bahuska. The new line would meet about seven miles east of Tulsa. Tulsa leaders decided to approach the Katy Railroad executives with their own survey and insisted that the line run through Tulsa because it would be shorter and less expensive. To help persuade the executives, city officials pledged to secure right-of-way rights and give them a bonus of about $12,000, which is $240,000 today. 
Three years later, city officials enlisted the same strategy for the Midline Valley Railroad and convinced officials with a $15,000 bonus. Lastly, they convinced the Santa Fe Railroad to redirect its tracks through Tulsa without even having to give them a financial bonus. Coaxing these railroads to Tulsa secured the city's future as an oil distributor point for the rest of the Southwest. And as new and larger oil fields erupted in Oklahoma, Tulsa attracted financiers who bankrolled those oil digs and the field workers as well as accommodations for those field workers. With these accomplishments, by 1911, Tulsa was the oil capital of the world. As a result, Tulsa exploded in growth. From 1907 to 1910, its population grew from 7,000 to 18,000. From 1910 to 1920, it quadrupled from 18,000 to 72,000. Tulsa struggled with the influx of new workers. Builders worked day and night to build Tulsa's infrastructure. It wasn't until 1910 that Tulsa even had paved streets. City officials enjoyed the wealth and influx of new residents, and with the money came vices. The hotels that ran along the railroad tracks attracted gamblers who set up rooms. It had prostitutes who solicited patrons by tapping on their windows and the whiskey flowed into the city from boats across the Arkansas River. During this time, nothing could derail the boom years in Tulsa. Looked over in all of this excitement was the growing community of black people north of the railroad tracks in Tulsa. Black Tulsans were relegated to the fringe of society and often ignored, but black people had been in Tulsa for almost 80 years. The first African Americans came to Tulsa, Oklahoma Indian Territory in 1830. The slaves to the five major tribes in the area, the Creek, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Cherokees, and the Seminoles. See, with the expansion of white settlements into the Southeast, this led to the passage of the Indian Removal Act. From 1830 to 1892, the United States forcibly removed all of the Eastern tribes west of the Mississippi into Indian Territory, which would become Oklahoma. After the Emancipation Proclamation, the treatment of newly free blacks varied from tribe to tribe. The Choctaw and the Chickasaw were reluctant to admit the end of slavery, but the Creeks and the Seminoles had already began intermarrying with slaves and quickly adopted them into their tribes. This integration with Native Americans was inviting to African Americans in the South who were accosted, segregated, and lynched. These attacks created a separatist movement with the idea of finding a safe haven where blacks could live freely and work. By 1890, African Americans set their sights on Oklahoma territory because it offered a warm climate and a tolerant Native American population. The area soon became a beacon for black nationalism and talk of an all black state. By the 1890s, Oklahoma territory offered more racial equality than any other place in either the North or the South. This caused an influx of African Americans into the territories that coincided with the land runs of 1889 and 1903. This influx stirred the fears in white homesteaders who were mostly from Southern states with Jim Crow laws. One homesteader warned of racial violence would erupt if blacks tried to assert their political rights within Oklahoma, stating that dead niggers make good fertilizer. Additionally, black homesteaders simply couldn't afford a long journey into the territories. So by 1900, whites outnumbered blacks by more than 10 to 1 in Oklahoma Territory, and any hope of racial tolerance was completely broken with Oklahoma statehood in 1907. See, the Negro question had been a big issue for both parties. The Democrats would appeal to white supremacy and led their party to sweep the election of delegates to the state constitutional convention in 1906. New state leaders felt that the entire nation was watching the newest state and to see how they handled the Negro problem. So the state legislature convened in an emergency legislative session on December 2nd, 1907 to pass legislation requiring separate railroad coaches, waiting rooms for people of African descent. It was the first bill ever passed by the state. And they also passed laws making marriage between a racist punishable by a felony of up to five years in prison and 1910 passed a constitutional amendment denying the right to vote to anyone who was not eligible before January 1st, 1866. And no African American was served on Oklahoma legislature from 1910 to 1964. In the years following Oklahoma statehood, black Tulsa's population still boomed as the racial atmosphere in Tulsa completely deteriorated. The oil discovery had transformed Greenwood just as it had done the rest of Tulsa. Greenwood was created in 1906 by one of Tulsa's earliest black pioneers, 
J.B. Stratford and O.W. Gurley. Stratford was born into slavery in Kentucky and was named J.B. after John the Baptist. J.B. would receive his education from Overland College and Indiana Law School. And by the time he got married, he decided he didn't want to work for anyone but himself. In 1899, Stratford moved to Tulsa because he had heard about economic opportunities for Negroes. O.W. Gurley came from Arkansas to Oklahoma in 1889 during the land rush. He was a black educator and an entrepreneur and gained his wealth speculating on land. At the turn of the century, the city was not completely racially segregated. There were several Negro businesses downtown, but J.B. Stratford believed that blacks had their best chance of success by pooling together their resources and working together and supporting each other in business. So he and O.W. Gurley bought large tracts of real estate north of the Frisco tracks, surveyed them plotted the blocks into streets and sold the areas only to African Americans and with that Black Wall Street was born. Greenwood was named after Greenwood, Mississippi. The first store was a grocery store on the corner of Archer and Greenwood Avenue. The community continued to grow along Archer Street and attracted real estate developers, a dentist, a black physician, and even ministers. Little by little, Stratford's dream of a black business district took shape along Archer Street. In 1905, the first school for black children opened at a Baptist church. And by the time Oklahoma was a state, Greenwood had two physicians, a newspaper, and three black grocers. In 1909, the Greenwood area was annexed into Tulsa, Oklahoma. During this time, between 1910 and 1920, the black Tulsa population surged from 2000 to 8,800. This growth was only slightly larger than a white population and the blacks represented about 13% of Tulsa's total population. Oil flowed into Greenwood and while blacks were excluded from working in the oil fields, they benefited indirectly from high paying domestic service jobs. Wages for domestic service jobs in Greenwood were unheard of in the rest of the South. A maid could receive 20 to $25 a week Chauffeurs, gardeners earn fifteen to twenty dollars, and porters and shoe shine could earn up to ten dollars a day. Black domestic workers accounted for forty percent of the black male employees, and ninety three percent of all the black female employees, and sixty two percent of all employees. Greenwood's crown jewel stood at 301 North Greenwood. It was the Stratford Hotel and it opened June 1st, 1918. J.B. Stratford was already rich. He owned 15 rental properties, 16 brick apartment buildings, and he earned more than $500 a month from his rental income and other sources. He was making about 10 times what the average black person made per month. But J.B. Stratford wanted a marvel in Greenwood so that black travelers did not have to settle for inferior accommodations while they were in Tulsa. The final cost of the hotel cost $50,000, which is $900,000 in today's money. Because of this, J.B. Stratford became the richest black man in Tulsa. And at the time that the Stratford Hotel was built, it was the largest structure owned and operated by a black person anywhere in the United States. Money that was flowing into Greenwood. Once again, the vices flourished. Whites came to Greenwood to gamble, drink, and pursue other illicit pleasures within their borders. Gamblers played a game known as the policy wheel, which involved three drawings a day, and the operator of the wheel hired porters, janitors, and domestic servants to sell chances to white patrons for five cents. A winner could pocket nine dollars. The salesman would then earn two to three dollars a day, and the operator would clear as much as twenty to thirty dollars. Prostitution and bootlegging and narcotics were also scattered throughout the district and violence was not uncommon but violence wasn't uncommon in all of Tulsa. Greenwood also had dance halls that played jazz which at the time was a uniquely black vice. The improvisational style alarmed the white Tulsans which preferred the blacks to be docile and quiet and denounced jazz as jungle music. All of these things caused white leaders to start to rally against Greenwood as a criminal cesspool even though many white Tulsans crossed into Greenwood for their vices, but the perception that Greenwood was a haven for sin helped them rationalize their fear for many white Tulsans. This growth of Greenwood, Oklahoma frightened white Tulsans because Greenwood had a population larger than many towns within Oklahoma. The Tulsa Democrat would state that Tulsa appears to be losing its prestige as the whitest town in Oklahoma. So in 1916, the city of Tulsa passed an ordinance that forbade people from either race from residing on a block where three quarters or more of the residents were of another race. The law simply put the status quo down on paper, but it also made segregation mandatory instead of voluntary. This 
segregation, though, had many benefits because black merchants had a captive audience for their goods and services. One dollar in Greenwood changed hands almost 16 times within Greenwood itself. While Greenwood was socially and physically segregated, it remained closely tied economically to white Tulsa. As racial tensions in Tulsa mirrored those in the rest of the South, so on May 31st, 1921 dick Rowland was on his way to the drexel building which was closed because it was a memorial day holiday but the building had something that very few buildings had downtown a colored restroom on the top floor so as Rowland walked into the elevator he met 17 year old sarah page who was operating the elevator reports differed from what happened next and has been a source of endless speculation but after Rowland entered the elevator at some point sarah page would scream and the clerk at the front desk of the drexel building would rush over as he saw Rowland flee the clerk then and call the police. Now, some say Sarah was a prostitute and Roland was her pimp. Other claim that they were lovers, but the wildly accepted version is that the two were simply strangers and Roland tripped, grabbed her arm, and she screamed. Whatever happened in the elevator, what is known is that the police were notified that Roland had attempted to sexually assault Paige, and initially the police were skeptical. In 1946, the police commissioner at the time, James Addison, stated that he had requested a quietly conducted investigation, but common sense alone should cast doubt on the rape claim. Only a black man with a death witch would try to rape a white woman in broad daylight in an office building in a major downtown thoroughfare. Still, it was Tulsa 1921. Simply the idea of a black man raping a white woman, no matter the evidence, would trigger an instant reaction. By the following day, the city had gotten word of the incident and police feared issues. So the police sent two officers, Henry Pack and Henry Carmichael, to arrest Roland. This served two roles. It showed that they were serious about their investigation and two, to protect him from reprisals. As word of the rest made its way downtown, the Tulsa Tribune released its first edition that day with the headline stating that nabbed the Negro for attacking girl in the elevator. Roland's guilt or innocent was besides the point. He had been arrested and the headline assumed guilt. The article had Tulsa buzzing and talk of a lynching had spread like wildfire. The chief of police, John Gustafson, moved Roland from the city jail to the county jail on 6 because it was more secure. Coincidentally, it was the same jail that Roy Belton had been lynched from only eight months earlier. Additionally, the Tribune didn't explicitly mention lynching, but African-Americans in Tulsa would claim that another editorial stated to lynch a Negro tonight. It's possible that the article simply didn't exist or it had gone defunct and afterwards anything from May 31st had been destroyed with only the Tribune's headline being the lone survivor. Either way, the Tribune's headline was more than enough to light an already short fuse. So by 3.30, the new police chief received a phone call stating that the Negro was to be lynched. By 4 o'clock, Tulsa had a dangerous combination of forces of a black man in jail, a newspaper making irresponsible claims, and a city with a history of mob justice. The police commissioner advised the sheriff to take Roland out of town, but he completely refused. As Tulsa made their way home, a crowd began to gather around the courthouse and three men entered the building and demanded Roland. They spoke to the sheriff and said, there's been talk of a lynching, but you might as well go home because no one's going to get to this Negro. The men simply left. The sheriff instructed his deputies to disable the elevator and station them behind the door at the top of a narrow staircase, which was the only way in or out. John Gustafson would make few trips back and forth to the courthouse between 7.30 and 9 p.m. As time went on, the angry white mob diminished and only left a group of curiosity seekers. It appeared as if the worst was over. However, the news from the Tribune and the possibility of a lynching had galvanized the black community in Tulsa. The community had decided that no black man was going to be lynched on their watch. I.H. Spears, a black lawyer in Tulsa, would later state that every time I heard of a lynching, it made me want to go buy more ammunition. While the general consensus was that the lynching had to be stopped, arguments arose on exactly how that would work, with younger, more militant African Americans rounding up weapons and ammunition, prepping for a battle, while older African Americans attempt to avert a destructive confrontation that would cost them the most. After O.W. Gurley had learned of a possible lynching, around 4 p.m., he walked to the courthouse and spoke to the sheriff. The sheriff assured Gurley that there would be no lynching as long as I'm sheriff, and as long as you keep your folks away from here, there won't be any trouble. Gurley attempted to explain to the group the more militant among them called him a liar and stated that a white man had been pulled out of that same jail only a few months earlier and they're going to take Roland too. However, Gurley would continue to appeal to the crowd and it worked. The crowd dispersed. 
Around 6.30 that night, another group convened with J.B. Stratford and a man by the name of A.J. Smitherman. Stratford instructed the group to go to the courthouse only if Roland's life was in danger or the sheriff called for help. They didn't want violence to spiral out of control and also realized there was very little margin for error. But at 9.15, a group of 25 armed African-Americans arrived at the courthouse. McCullough stood on top and told them to go home. You're going to get a lot of people hurt. And that they had no business parading around with guns like that. One of the black men told him that we're going to go home when we get that Negro boy that you want to lynch. McCullough told them that nobody's getting lynched and that he wasn't going to be charged. And the girl had to admit it that he had done him no harm. McCullough then explained to the group that they couldn't release Roland to the angry mob or a group of armed black citizens. So the group decided to leave. But this is the moment in events where the white mob turned from a lynching to now they felt that they needed to protect themselves from a potential black onslaught. As an armed group of blacks had just come into their part of town, and if they came back, they wanted to be fully prepared. So some of the mob went to their homes and others headed to the armory. Around 9 p.m., Major James Bell of the 180th Infantry called the police and the sheriff, but was assured that they could handle the situation. So the commanding officers of three National Guard units still prepared to leave the next day for Tulsa and ordered the National Guard members in Tulsa to report to the armory. Shortly thereafter, 400 whites showed up to the armory demanding rifles and guns, and they were explained that the armory was four guardsmen only and ordered them to leave. Around 10 p.m., a contingency of 75 blacks made their way to the courthouse again. The black group heard of further reports of whites attempting to storm the courthouse, and they were determined to get Roland out of that courthouse. So the group once again confronted Sheriff McCullough. McCullough told them that that Roland was safe. He told them that parading around with guns and said violence is easy to start, but hard to stop. He told them to look at the window on the top floor, and they would cut down any attempt to take over this courthouse. Now go home before you get a lot of people shot. And as the group of blacks attempted to back off, a white man approached one of the members of the group and said, nigga, what are you doing with that pistol? He replied, I'm going to use it if I need to. Then a struggle ensued and a shot was fired in the air. And with that, all hell broke loose. The outnumbered group of blacks scattered down the street, ran to reach Greenwood, which was about seven blocks away in the midst of a hell of bullets. A few members of both sides lay dead or dying in the streets. Some of the groups did reach Greenwood where they felt they had familiar ground or some reinforcements. Near the courthouse on 4th, an ambulance showed up and attempted to help some of the injured men, but a group of whites ordered the ambulance not to touch any other black men because they came here looking for trouble and he better get going or he was going to join them. Naturally. The ambulance left. Skirmishes continued downtown as the rest of the black group attempted to race back to Greenwood in a desperate retreat. The white mob turned into rioters after being denied guns at the armory and the group armed themselves with guns from sporting goods stores, pawn shops, and hardware stores in downtown Tulsa. Not only did they steal pistols and shotguns and ammunition, but they also stole jewelry, leather goods, and clothes. The mob stole more than 43 thousand dollars white Tulsans believed that this was a black insurrection and an invasion of downtown tulsa by blacks hell-bent on conquering the white inhabitants the phrase negro uprising was used often in national guard reports and one national guard even referred to blacks as the enemy Unlike other riots in which citizens worked outside or against the law, the police department legitimized the riot by deputizing the group of men to patrol the streets between the black and white sections of town. They gave the men badges, ribbons, and guns, and others were commissioned as special deputy sheriffs. Walter White, who was the assistant secretary for the NAACP, was actually among some of the men deputized. Because he had blonde hair and blue eyes, he could easily pass for white and travel throughout the South writing investigations about lynching. He had arrived in Tulsa just in time to be deputized at Town Hall and said that he was only asked three questions, my name, my age, and my address. He would explain later that I might have been a thug or a murderer or escaped convict. None of that mattered because my skin was white and that was enough. Afterwards, he was deputized and told, now go out, and shoot a nigger because the law is behind you. Shortly after the riot begun, Governor James Brooks Ayers Robertson was told of the unrest and reached out to Police Chief Gustafson, but was assured they had the situation under control, asked to not look helpless in front of the governor. But shortly after the shooting started, he called Major Bell at the armory and asked him to dispatch local National Guard to clear the streets of Negroes. In the early hours of the riot, 
white Tulsans were massing a large enough force just to deter the blacks from Greenwood. The police deputized citizens and Major Daly from the National Guard. When he reached the police station at 12.05, he instructed the white mob that helped maintain order if they followed his instructions. He formed patrols of 20 men led by servicemen and told them to gather up the Negroes but only fire to protect life. Even if he wanted to restore order, he didn't have the manpower because it was 5,000 armed white men running up and down the streets. The only chance they had was for the Oklahoma militia to send a large number of troops from other parts of the state. But no one wanted to make that call for fear of looking incompetent or simply out of pride. It wasn't until 1.46 in the morning that Governor Robertson received a telegram about a race riot developing in Tulsa. And the governor didn't make the call to the National Guard until 2.14 in the morning. And it wasn't until 5 a.m. that a special train of the Oklahoma militia left Oklahoma City for Tulsa. Back in Greenwood, the news of a riot was spreading very slowly and many blacks simply went to bed. Shots were common in Tulsa and many thought the blacks that had ventured into Tulsa would bear the brunt of this trouble. Of course, there was no Negro invasion. The group from the initial confrontation had escaped into Greenwood and had made their stand. This is where the riot moved from Tulsa to Greenwood. Shortly after midnight, gunfire erupted along the railroad tracks, which was the line of demarcation between the white and black districts. Unfortunately, Greenwood had a huge vulnerability. It was extremely vulnerable to fire. So during the battle, along the tracks, several white men threw oily rags into buildings, set them on fire, and they burst into flames with the wind doing the rest. And with that, Greenwood was ablaze. Meanwhile, in White Tulsa, the anticipation of a potentially race-motivated showdown created a weird, festive atmosphere with a mix of alcohol and guns. As the night wore on, the crowds in the street got larger, many of them with guns in one hand and a bottle in the other. Around 2 a.m., a large crowd gathered on the corner of 2nd and Lewis. A man stood up on a car, stating that men were going into daylight. They came into our town looking for trouble with guns trying to take over. They started trouble and we would give them a finish and a night that they would never forget. Be ready to go into nigger town. Back in Greenwood, the fires of summer, damage was mostly contained. The shooting had all but stopped. Many blacks thought that the riot was over and they had actually thought they might have won. They were just about to find out how wrong they were. In the early morning hours of June 1st, a thousand white Tulsans gathered on the northern edge of Greenwood. Minutes later, a siren wailed and the invasion was on. Thousands of white men poured into Greenwood. A machine gun was placed on top of a grain elevator and fired into Greenwood onto any black Tulsans car that moved. Thousands of people came here just to watch and take pictures on the southwestern edge of Greenwood and riders divided into smaller groups. And once they reached homes and businesses, they would shoot the lock off. And once inside, they would take any valuables and smash everything else and piled the bedding and furniture and set the house ablaze. As the fires moved along Archer Street, homes were ignited, telephone poles, power lines were toppled or also set on fire. As soon, all the power was out in Greenwood. As the morning wore on, the buildings on Archer Street disintegrated or burned out and new fires were carefully started so that they avoided the white homes on the other side of the tracks. The police seemed intent on helping the mob rather than protecting black citizens and V.B. Bostic, a black deputy, stated that the white officer drove him and his wife from their home, poured gasoline on the floor and set their house on fire. Some of the officers then changed out of their uniform into plain clothes and led the groups into Greenwood. In reports after the riot, the police chief Gustafson spoke about people setting fires that didn't have on uniforms but did have on stars and badges. In the court testimony, he testified that he did not implicate his own officers but suggested that the special police started the fire. We were unable to limit the commission to our choice. They might have lost their head and applied a torch, but it was positively in contradiction to our orders. Also, while the Tulsa Fire Department did not join in the riot, they relented to the mob. The fire station responded to a call at 2 a.m. on Main and Archer, but as firefighters attached their holes to the water plug, several white Tulsans pointed guns at the firefighters and told them to stay away from the holes or else someone would get killed. The fires raged in the background as the men disengaged their holes and went back to the fire station and went to sleep. When the next alarm sounded, the firefighters just simply didn't leave. It wasn't until the next next day when the fire department would attempt to do their jobs and still there were no match for the mob who was setting fires as the firemen were attempting to put them out. The riot 
overwhelmed the blacks in Greenwood and left them with very few options. Some continued to mount in armed resistance while others tried to hide anywhere they could. Many attempted to escape on foot by walking the nine miles to Sandy Springs or other communities. Saving your assets was simply not going to happen. Survival was your only option. So black men and women ran through Greenwood in their night clothes, bare feet, sometimes carrying their children in their arms. Even when blacks did surrender to somewhat peaceful guardsmen that didn't guarantee your survival. A.C. Jackson was one of the most prominent surgeons in America and one of the leaders of Greenwood. When he attempted to surrender to a group of white men as Jackson walked out of his house with his hands raised up in his air, the small mob approached him and two whites fired their guns into his chest. As they walked away, they shot him in the leg and then they set his house on fire with gasoline. With homes now defenseless, the mob rummaged through the drawers and cabinets and celebrated their good fortune. Black Sheriff Barney Cleaver, when he left the courthouse on June 1st, he saw two white women carrying his wife's clothes. And the rioters attempted to justify their looting of Greenwood because they felt like blacks had amassed their wealth in some illegal underground economy that allowed for an inferior race to prosper and that black success was intolerable to the social order of white supremacy. So in taking their position, possessions, put them back in their place, and tip the scales back in proper alignment. Therefore, looting the homes of these uppity blacks was a reason for celebration. 914 AM, General Charles Barrett from Oklahoma City had 190 National Guard and soldiers arrive in Tulsa. By then, most of the destruction was done and they struggled to restore order because it was 10,000 plus rioters in the streets. So General Barrett ordered additional troops from nearby towns. Meanwhile, he allowed the state troops to eat and didn't oppose martial law until 1149 when the riot was effectively over. Also, the National Guard had some of the most intense gun battles with the blacks of Greenwood. Between 8 and 9, the police requested urgent assistance of two units to stop black men on the northern edge of Greenwood from firing into white homes. 150 guardsmen would show up with rifles and pistols and were met with immediate fire from a group of blacks in Greenwood. The battle lasted for over 20 minutes, but the group was overwhelmed and began to retreat into buildings within Greenwood for cover. They barricaded themselves into a few houses and refused to stop firing before they were eventually killed. Later, the Mount Zion Baptist Church was rumored to be a house of armaments for the blacks in Greenwood, a rumor of 20 caskets that had been taken into the church that were full of rifles. Whether this was true or not, the building was sturdy and provided an excellent fortress for anyone that charged the church and were quickly repelled by the gunmen inside. One heavy firefight that morning lasted for over an hour, so seeking greater firepower, the white Tulsans called on the National Guardsmen and they quickly arrived with a flatbed truck with a heavy machine gun on a tripod. He fired for five or six minutes till the belfry collapsed and the rest of the building was set on fire. For the blacks of Greenwood, it was impossible to determine the difference between the National Guard and the mob because they were both fighting the black population. Another added dimension to the invasion was the element of aircraft that were flown over by the mob that swept over Greenwood in the early morning. The exact reasons for their presence was under debate, but numerous blacks said that the aircraft were used to assault Greenwood and pilots either dropped incendiary devices like turpentine or dynamite or strafed black victims using rifles. Walter White wrote, Eight planes were employed to spy on the movement of Negroes, according to some, were used to bomb the colored section. But the police would state that they were only used to monitor fires and to locate refugees. In a final humiliation from the mass destruction of Greenwood, black Tulsans were removed from what was left of their homes at Greenwood, lined up in the street with their hands raised up in the air and marched out of Greenwood. Men, women, and children were carrying bundles of clothes and personal items on their backs or in carts with the jail full. They were sent to the convention hall. Armed guards had to hold white crowds of the blacks of Greenwood were brought in and some businesses even gave their employees the day off to celebrate nigger day. When the convention hall was full, the blacks of Greenwood were taken downtown to the fairground. By Tuesday, June 2nd, 6,000 blacks had been consolidated onto the fairgrounds and an area that was once used to groom cows was now transformed into their sleeping areas. 
In the aftermath, the safest black man in Tulsa was Dick Rowland himself, who stayed in the jail under guard all night and wasn't taken out until the next morning, never to return to Tulsa. Later in 1921, the case against Dick Rowland was dismissed after the Tulsa County attorney received a letter from Sarah Page stating that she did not want to press charges. Due to the chaotic nature of the Tulsa massacre and the fact that many victims were buried in unmarked graves, estimates of casualties resulted in a wide variety of answers. The Tulsa Tribune reported 31 deaths, including 21 black and 9 white, while the Los Angeles Express reported 175 deaths. In 2001, the Oklahoma 1921 Race Massacre Commission reported that 36 people died, 26 blacks and 10 white. Today, the Oklahoma Bureau of Vital Statistics report that 36 people had died. However, based on the verbal and written accounts of survivors and the American Red Cross, some historians estimate the death toll as many as 300. Even by the lowest estimates, the Tulsa Race Massacre remains one of the deadliest race-inspired riots in United States history. The entire 36 blocks of the Greenwood Commercial District were destroyed. A total of 191 black-owned businesses, churches, a junior high, the district's only hospital was lost. According to the Red Cross, 1,256 homes were burned and another 215 were looted and vandalized. The Tulsa Real Estate Exchange estimated a real estate personal property loss at $1.2 million, which is the equivalent of $30 million in 2020. Very few claims were paid because most of their policies excluded riot damage. Witnesses in a lawsuit brought by property owner William Renford testified that at least some officers and in many special officers commissioned by the Tulsa police participated in the destruction of Greenwood. However, no one could say for certainty that officers had acted under the direction of local authorities. As a result, the Oklahoma Supreme Court ruled against Renford and in favor of its insurance company. That decision effectively ended hundreds of lawsuits and damage claims against insurance companies and the city of Tulsa. In the decades following the massacre, the details of the Tulsa Race Massacre remained largely unknown for decades. It was not until the dedication of the Tulsa's Reconsolidation Park in December of 2009 that there were organized efforts to commemorate this event. Instead, the incident remained largely covered up. Articles from the day of the incident that sparked violence had been removed from the archived copies of the Tulsa Tribune. Later copies from 1936 and 1946 entitled 15 Years Ago Today and 25 years ago today make no mention of the Tulsa massacre. It was not until 2004 that the Oklahoma Department of Education required that the Tulsa race massacre be taught in Oklahoma schools. In 2006, 75 years after the incident occurred, the Oklahoma legislator appointed a Tulsa race riot commission to create a historically accurate account of the riot and documented the causes and damages. In 2018, the commission was renamed the Tulsa Race Massacre Commission. The commission appointed historians and archaeologists to create oral and written accounts and to share possible locations of mass graves of black victims. Archaeologists identified over four likely locations of such graves. However, no bodies have been found until July of 2020 when Oklahoma archaeologists uncovered human remains on top of a success expected mass grave in a city cemetery. Despite attempts to suppress details of the rioting, the commission stated that these are not myths or rumors or speculation. This is an historical record. In its final report, the commission recommended a payment of $33 million in reparation to the 120 verified survivors and descendants of survivors from the Tulsa Race Massacre. However, the legislature never took any action and no reparations have been paid. In 2002, the Tulsa Metropolitan Ministry private charity paid a total of $28,000 to the remaining survivors with each getting $200 a piece. Thank you. This has been One Mike History. If you like stories like this, you can find more stories like this at onemikehistory.com. Also, if you want to support the channel, you can do so on Buy Me Coffee on my Patreon page in the description below. Please give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and support the YouTube channel. Peace.